Hello, welcome. My name is Philip Kolianos. We are here in Stockholm, Sweden at a brand new studio called Keepset Games, which is founded by me and a couple of my fantastic friends from way back. Um, we're right now developing a brand new science fiction co-op adventure, uh, which we're super excited about. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about my previous experience, which is called It Takes Two. Um, and that project, I was working as a lead level designer. So it's from a game design perspective. We're going to look at how me and the design team got together and produced the huge amounts of variety and all the mechanics that went into that game. So first, we're going to look a little bit at a background, how you know It Takes Two came to be. Then I'm going to have uh, to talk a little bit about the technology behind uh, the production. And at the very end of the presentation, we're going to have a look at a case study where I'm just going to go through the whole creative process of, of making a little part of the game uh, from start to finish. All right, so where did it all start? So It Takes Two was developed by a studio uh, here in Stockholm as well called Hazelight. Uh, it was founded about eight years ago and it was um, the first game that we made together there was called A Way Out. Uh, it was a cooperative experience that you play together. Um, and it was also a game where uh, what made that game kind of unique was the fact that we had, uh, we, we needed to be several players. It was a cooperative experience only. Uh, and when the game came out, uh, people really liked that. Uh, it was something that they really appreciated and it made the game stand out. So it became kind of a natural thing that for It Takes Two, uh, we did, you know, it kind of followed in the same vein. Now, um, when developing uh, A Way Out, uh, there were a lot of similarities there that we can identify at first. So A Way Out uh, was multiplayer, meaning, you know, since it's a co-op game, you have to play with your friend. We also had to support playing over network, which was a huge part of the technical challenge there which is the same for It Takes Two. Uh, on top of that, uh, both games are always split screen. Uh, it was also kind of a linear story. You know, you told a story about two convicts, you know, trying to escape prison and to uh, revenge, uh, take out the revenge on the guy who put them there. So it's a very linear story, like a movie almost. And, and that's something that It Takes Two ended up doing as well. So both games uh, were uh, linear and uh, telling the story from start to finish. And one thing that A Way Out also did was having a huge variety in mechanics. You don't really think about it, but that was actually a huge part of the game. And the reason why I bring this up is that, you know, when you look at it from a technical perspective, both A Way Out and It Takes Two has um, a lot of similarities from a technical perspective. And one thing uh, it, that started uh, when at the end of A Way Out, uh, you know, the programmers of the, uh, the game realized that we had to do something. They couldn't really work as fast as they needed to, to be able to do all the mechanics in a way out. We had shooting sequences, we had car chases, we had, you know, a lot of unique mechanics that was only used for a single scene. And that on top of the fact that we, uh, you know, we, the design team, you know, constantly changed what the game needed to be. Uh, we had, you know, changing the design direction, made it very difficult for them to work as fast as they could. So they started developing something new, uh, which was called, uh, they implemented something called AngelScript into the Unreal Engine 4. So Unreal Engine 4 was the same engine that we used for both A Way Out, as well as It Takes Two. And they made this plugin for Unreal Engine 4 uh, where you put Angel Script as sort of a super fast scripting layer in between C++ and the blueprints. Um, and it was quite fascinating because, uh, you know, they could, uh, Angel Script is something that you can like write really fast code. And then as the game is running, you can basically change the lines of code and press save and immediately the behavior will kind of propagate onto the screen, which is uh, absolutely amazing. And it always worked. And I think that was, one thing that kind of caught me and the design team's attention, like, hey, you know, this scripting language looks really interesting. And personally, I kind of come from uh, a background of modding and, and indie game development. So I'm kind of a uh, self-taught programmer. And I thought, you know, hey, actually this angel script thing 
seems really interesting, not only for programmers, but for us designers as well to prototype our own mechanics and stuff like that. So I thought, you know, maybe there's something that other guys in the design team are interested in as well. Uh, and if not, at least I will use it. So, uh, you know, at the beginning of, you know, development for It Takes Two, which was the next, next game, uh, we sat down together with programmers and they would show us the ropes, learn uh, a lot of us in the team how to program and how to use their amazing tools. And we started really early on um, using AngelScript as kind of a part of our prototyping phase. And in the beginning of ETX2, uh, you know, before we, the game had taken form and we knew what the game was going to be, we just sat down and we tried a lot of mechanics back and forth, uh, not really caring too much about the context. We just focused on what was fun from a cooperative experience. And, and then we would use AngelScript as a way to uh, realize those ideas and a way for us to train and get used to the tools. And as we kind of you know, started molding and understanding what the game was gonna be about, you know, we started to understand what was fun, you know, and we had the story coming along with It Takes Two, um, we realized that we could actually, a lot of these systems that we started prototyping was something that we designers could keep ownership of throughout the whole thing. Um, usually, you know, a designer maybe would do a small prototype and then a programmer would kind of uh, get the rest of it and take over at some point. But we realized we didn't really have to do that. Uh, and I think that's a huge key because that meant that the person who came up with the idea could realize the whole thing from idea to kind of a finished product. Uh, another huge win was that the programmers who did all the gameplay used the same tools as the level design team, which was a huge win. Uh, the interesting part here is also that, you know, yes, we were a level design team, but suddenly we were also kind of programming and designing at the same time. And the line between, you know, level designer, game designer, whatever, uh, became very blurred. Uh, we were all suddenly people, creative people, making stuff as we went along. And I think that was also a very good thing because usually if you have, everyone is given a very specific title, they tend to kind of get like some sort of imaginary bounds around. Like, okay, my title is animator, I'm not supposed to do anything outside of that. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, having this kind of blurred lines between what you were supposed to not, uh, it was more about kind of the end experience. So I think that was some, a, a huge win. So, but how did that all look like? You know, if we kind of just take it to case cut study from start to finish, you know, how was AngelScript and how was the creative process of, of It Takes Two? Uh, it would always start with uh, the storyboard first. So we would basically have a storyboard that would inform sort of the context of the entire game. It was kind of be uh, very much focused on the story itself and not so much the mechanics or what's gonna be a level, what's not gonna be a level. It was more about the general kind of, this is what the story is about. And then we would sort of divide that into chapters. So uh, at first, uh, when I looked at uh, this case study in Dinoland, um, uh, it was part of Rose's Room, which is um, a part of the game where the players hadn't really started mending, or the characters in the game hadn't started really mending their relationship yet. Uh, they were uh, still kind of, you know, confused about, you know, this magical word they ended up in. And I, I think we would use um, in, in the early levels of the game would be to add mechanics inside the levels uh, uh, instead. Uh, so that it would just something on top of their regular moveset. So we looked at the storyboard. We knew that, okay, we're gonna make the Rosa's room a playroom. What would be fun in playrooms? And we would throw out different themes. And one of them would of course be, you know, toy, toy dinosaurs. It's something very relatable. Everybody likes dinosaurs. And then we would start brainstorming around that. You know, what would that be like? Uh, and one of the ideas that I remember floating around a lot was this uh, long neck brontosaurus. Because we knew from a story perspective also that there was going to be like a small toy train, tra train track throughout this whole uh, toy room. And the players would kind of need to use that to progress throughout. And this uh, track would then be blocked by different things that you would have to move away to be able to progress. And we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this long neck dinosaur would be able to kind of put the track together uh, or move pieces? And that's sort of 
just the ideas. You know, we, at this point, we were just throwing ideas around. And then, of course, another key thing was that, uh, you know, one thing that I think is really important about cooperative games is that uh, we noticed when we prototype that if, if uh, one player has one unique ability, say in this case, the long neck, the other player needed something else. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you had like a small dinosaur that could head up, headbutt objects and they would kind of flip upside down. That would be really cool. Um, so then, you know, each player had something unique there. And at this point, we're still just throwing these ideas around. And then we would start immediately prototyping. So me and a programmer would uh, sit down um, and start dividing up the work. Okay, I will do one of the dinos, he would do the other one, and that's it, we were just two guys. Now, uh, another really important aspect when doing a game which has like unique gameplay for each and every level of the game was that we really had to constrain the time, meaning uh, time boxing was of the essence. You know, it's very easy when you start from scratch or making a mechanic like this that you would spend weeks and weeks and weeks just doing, uh, exploring what you could do with a long neck dinosaur. Um, but we had to stay really focused and on track to make sure that we didn't end up doing that. So what we would do is just time box from on a weekly basis, you know, what we would do. Because we only had a couple of weeks in making this whole scene. So uh, the next step would be to start implementing. And given the time boxing, we also realized that we would have to constrain things a lot. We would have to make it very, very simple. Uh, if the long neck could walk around and pick up things anywhere and put them anywhere, uh, that would be a huge technical challenge. So instead, we decided, okay, moving objects, you know, lock it to a 2D kind of movement. That's something that's very controllable uh, for us developing. Uh, it's also very clear and readable for the player to understand what's going on. So we decided we we're going to do that. Uh, and then we started looking at the other dino, uh, the head button dino. And we also realized that, okay, if this dino is going to move around everywhere, that's also going to be a problem. So very early on, because of time constraints, we decided to constrain the other dino onto a 2D movement as well. So now we had like sort of a technical idea of like, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, next challenge was, of course, that, okay, we had so little time. We didn't even, weren't even able to give the small dino a jump or anything like that. They could just move back and forth on a line. So the headbutting part would be quite difficult to do. So instead we decided, okay, let's do a ground slam instead. And the ground slam would then flip a bunch of objects. You know, now we're starting to get somewhere. So this was maybe after a week of just coding and putting everything together, we could have like a little level where we could test these things out. But we also realized, you know, uh, th we needed some, some icing on the cake here. Because one extra improvement on cooperative mechanics is to make sure that they really complement each other. So yes, the big dino could move objects and help the little dino to kind of progress. But we added a flair to it where the big dino could then grab certain objects and prevent them from flipping. And this would um, allow uh, me as a designer to create really interesting uh, puzzles where, uh, you know, the big dino could affect the state of that level together with the small dino. And it kind of required, you know, discussion between the players. So. Now that we had all those keys in place, and it sounded like a good idea, we started to, to uh, implement this, and, and uh, then it was more a matter of you know, creating a small scene, a small level with, with you know, these mechanics that we had together. And that was, you know, from a game designer perspective, you know, very standardized. You know, we would start with teaching, just moving one platform up with one of the dinosaurs so the other player could get to the second dino. And the second dino gets the chance to do the headbutt or the ground slam action and you would see that what was happening and then step by step we would just increase the difficulty. Uh, and then uh, once we had that scene in place and, and all those mechanics felt like a good kind of, we had a good feeling in our stomachs, this makes sense, we would start to uh, test things. So we would bring this to people outside of the studio to, to test it and, and then we would have a look at how they kind of uh, experienced the whole thing. What were they looking for? Did they understand what we wanted them to do? Did they understand the mechanics? 
and we realized that yeah there is a bunch of things here we needed to highlight you know we need to tilt the cameras a little bit show some hints show some icons and button presses and stuff like that uh, but in general we had a really good feeling so based on that feedback we only and early on i think i would like to emphasize that that early on we only looked at what the players understood and not we didn't really care about what was fun um, then we would move on to uh, think about the context. Okay, so how does the players end up here? The cutscenes, you know, all those the things that was going to happen um, uh, along the way to kind of bring the context and have this scene fit into the grand scheme of things. So if you look at the conclusions, um, uh, one thing that uh, was really uh, grateful and great was the fact, you know, I could sit next to a programmer and I could work with him. Uh, we used the same tools and that was um, really efficient. Another really good thing was that, you know, I could sit and have complete ownership of, of my work all the way from first idea to, to the finished product. Um, and that was a huge success, I think. Um, and Sure, I mean, some systems and whatever, you know, had to be handed over to a programmer because, because they became too complex. Uh, but all in all, I think it was a huge win. And the fact that we had these tools and they, that enabled us to do all this stuff. Um, now, you might think that, you know, isn't that a big of a risk? You know, you have a level designer who's usually only building levels. And then suddenly you give all these other responsibilities on top. You know, we're talking game design, we talk programming on top of level design. You know, isn't that risky? And I would agree, yes, it is risky. Uh, but the game, a game like this kind of required to think a little bit outside the box from a production perspective to even make it happen. Uh, and personally, I kind of, one of my mantras is, you know, if you go to the gym and you pull the same weight every day, you're not gonna, you're not gonna reach your full potential. So I think a, a good step or a good key here was to put everybody a little bit outside of their comfort zone uh, to kind of see them reach their full potential. And then I think also for me as a lead, uh, it was fantastic to see the team kind of jumping on these challenges and how much they grew along the way and how much everybody became better and the ownership they had uh, because they could, you know, actually have so much hands-on experience. And then, of course, uh, another key thing here is the simplification of mechanics that I mentioned. That trying to constrain and simplify the idea as much as you possibly can, uh, it helped out in two ways. One, of course, like I mentioned, was the time. Uh, we didn't have much time per mechanic. Another big win, of course, uh, with that, the sort of you didn't re you don't really think about it, but a, a secondary win is that simple mechanics are often very easy to communicate. Uh, if you only have one button to press, uh, you know, it's going to be very easy to teach that to the players. So I think that was a really nice side product um, uh, to, to it all. And with that said, uh, thank you so much for listening. So evaluating the difficulty uh, is, is only a matter of collecting data from players. Uh, so whether that is from a statistical standpoint where you have 10,000 of players you know, playing through an already finished game or just sitting and watching, doing a qualitative sort of uh, investigation where you're just sitting behind your subject watching exactly what they're doing or recording on a screen. I think the importance there is to uh, agree on, you know, what is your game going to be? Is it going to be difficult or easy? Uh, those words are doesn't mean the same thing to everyone in the team. So you need to make sure, first of all, that everybody agrees on what easy means, if, if it's easy you're going for. And then kind of, it's actually a good thing to set up a few criteria as well. So like, if it's a game where you fall down and die, okay, uh, if we don't want it to be easy, maybe the player shouldn't die more than a maximum twice on the same challenge. So you set up a little bit of parameters. And once you've kind of agreed on that as a group, it's much more easy to do that evaluation because then you have, you know, a player that you're recording or watching. What are they doing? Uh, you know, is there a challenge where the same player dies over and over and over again? Um, you have to take a step back. Does that mean that all players are doing the same thing or just that one player? And if it's just that one player, is that really your target audience? And you have to ask yourselves that. So there's a couple of steps you need to make. And 
Um, this is uh, a little bit different if we're talking about puzzles, you know, challenges that are not about, you know, winning or failing. It could be a puzzle where you need to figure something out, uh, more of a mind game. And, and if that's the type of game you're doing, I think it's also good to keep in mind, you know, how long do you allow the player to be stuck and thinking before you feel, uh oh, now too much time has passed, you know, uh, this is a too difficult challenge for the players. So I think, uh, to summarize, uh, you need to set up some sort of rules and, and a framework for how you evaluate difficulty and make sure that everyone agrees on, on those parameters and, because that makes it much more easy for you as a developer to go into uh, playtesting with confidence and look at, you know, did you hit your targets uh, or not? And what can you do to, to make uh, all the challenges or puzzles or whatever it is uh, to kind of fit the targets you're going for? The absolute key uh, for designing successful co-op game kind of comes with the word cooperation or collaboration. I think it's incredibly important that uh, the players, they need to have abilities um, or there needs to be a space for the players to collaborate and give them tools that uh, require them to work together. So whether that is uh, you have a nail and I have a hammer and you have to hold up the nail and I have to hammer it. I mean, you know, it could be that easy, uh, but having the game encouraging and sometimes even enforcing us as players to work together to achieve a certain goal. I think that's incredibly important. Another thing to even step it up a notch is to make sure that those abilities um, require some timing, you know. Uh, it's not like I can place the nail and walk away and then you come 10 minutes later and smash it with your hammer, but rather make sure that both players are there at the same time, forcing them to communicate about how to, how to nail uh, that nail into the coffin. Mm -hmm.